talk to you today, I actually get you for a couple hours, but the first topic will be to talk about some approaches to trying to organize team activities. Now I realize, how many of you are, say, uh, junior people? I would I use that term. So that would be a grad student or a postdoc. Raise your hand high, I have a hard time seeing. That's pretty much everybody. How many, how many would consider yourself a senior person where you have people who work with you, underneath you, under your guidance? Okay, so, so, so this is a talk that's relevant for both audiences, um, and, but for those people who are junior, um, your, the intent here is to try to inform you so that you can go back and maybe take, if you think some of these ideas are compelling, you can go back to your team, talk with your faculty advisor, your mentor, and, and see if there's something that resonates uh, with your mentor so that you as a team can try to uh, adopt or, or, or you know, in some way be inspired or by what I'm trying to say. For those of you who are mentors already, my intent is to, to convey to you a, a, an approach that is working for me. I am using these techniques right now with my research students, with my software teams, and finding them to be very effective. So I want to share these techniques with you uh, so that hopefully they're meaningful and valuable to, to you. Um, so so I'm, I'm a scientist in residence at Sandia uh, National Laboratories, also scientist in residence at St. John's. And so some of the, the team stuff is related to my students at St. John's, and I'll show you. Um, Sandia funded my uh, activities in general in this area, so I acknowledge that uh, funding. I'm grateful for it. Um, so a bit of an outline. I'm going to talk with you about small teams, uh, models and challenges, talk to you about a little bit about agile workflows, uh, and then we're going to do some hands-on stuff, stuff at the end uh, of it. Okay, so I mentioned some prerequisites. Uh, if you ha most of you have a GitHub account. If you don't or and you don't want one, that's fine. Maybe look over the shoulder of someone when we do the hands-off stuff. Uh, in between now and the time we start, if you can think of, say, six to eight tasks, I want to actually have you enter tasks uh, into a repository. Just you know, scribble them down, write them, you know, put a little, uh, start a little email to yourself or whatever. Uh, but in some way, just create this list of six to eight things. Um, and then for later as well, bring up a GitHub markdown cheat sheet if you need one. Maybe you don't need one. Um, this is one that I think uh, uh, quite a few people use. Just put that window aside for the moment. Just type in GitHub markdown cheat sheet. You're going to find something. You'll probably find this one near the top. Okay, so those are a few things we'll need for later. Most of the things I'm going to talk about right now are related to small teams. Now, large teams are a big deal as well, but it's my experience in science, at least, that, small te uh, that large teams are an aggregation of small teams. So anything that we're going to say right now for small teams has impact and relevance to large teams. And then there are additional challenges and constraints, cultural issues that you may have to deal with with a large team, which we won't necessarily get to today, but I can certainly take questions if you have them uh, when we get to the end. So, What's the typical small team composition? Well, you have a senior staff or a faculty member. That person is a stable presence on the team. They're there for the long haul, right? They're your mentors. And then you have these junior people coming and going, usually postdocs or students. They are transient, right? So the faculty member has probably the objective of making the project successful. That's probably the key thing. They're advancing their career as well, but that, that project is a big part of it. Students have two objectives, right? They want to contribute to the project, but they also, you also want to get out in a finite amount of time. And so that dual objective is really important as part of the model. We need to be able to take that and work with it and manage it in a very explicit and useful way. Um, as I said, large teams have the challenges but, uh, that are unique, but they are com compositions of small teams. And so in this large team, you have other things like policies become even more important because they're explicit statements of what a community gives to the, the community members and how the community members give back. Uh, and then also cultures tend to be more varied if you have a large team. There's a greater chance of cultural diversity 
and, and cultural is a broad term uh, as I'm using it, but where the basic assumptions that team members have about what we say to each other, how we act, what our axioms in life are will be different. And so we need to explore those different uh, uh, systems of thought and come to understand each other better to avoid surprises, usually negative surprises. So what are some of the challenges in a small team? Um, ramping up junior members, right? You have to give them the background to do their job. You have to help them learn the conceptual models uh, that you're using on the project. You have to give them the required background and software uh, practices, processes, and tools. Um, and then you also, even from day one, need to start preparing for the day that person is going to, to leave. Um, so you need to do things that have in mind that this person will someday depart and you want to retain the value of their work after they go and you have to prepare for that. Okay, so um, I, I have to be a little careful. This is, I'm saying this is a research team member's life cycle. That doesn't mean like their birth and death, but their membership on the team, okay? So, so this is you, right, for the most part. Most of you in this room, you, you come in Right? And your, your mentor, your advisor says, okay, what are we gonna work on together? You identify the things that you're going to work on. And what I'm gonna show you is, is an, an initiation checklist. So a lot of times this discussion is informal, you get a vague idea of what you're going to do, but I'm gonna propose to you that having an explicit checklist of things that you're gonna work on as part of this initiation phase is really valuable, okay? Then the ramp up, you work through the initiation list, right? You click the checkbox, says I finished this activity, I'm done, I'm making progress. Um, and you initiate your project activities. And then in ongoing planning, we, we're gonna use a Kanban workflow and, and we're going to create and observe some team policies. Think this is expect, con, expected conduct from you as a team member. And then same thing for ongoing work, Con, you know, this, uh, conduct your activities, observe the policies, and then as you approach the, the end of your time on a project or even at that institution, we start looking toward in very explicit ways, how do we manage your departure? What do we want to make sure you get done and, and put aside so that when you leave and somebody else comes in, and maybe even concurrently that's happening, that we get the maximum value from your work. And so we ramp you down, you depart, and then we bring in the next crop of people and you go off to your successful career as a senior person, okay? So this is basically the idea. What are we gonna use? I'm gonna promote uh, checklists and policies as major elements to making your team work well. And so you have a new person, new team member checklist, um, you have a departing team member checklist, and then if you're a steady contributor, you know, during, in between beginning and ending, we want policies to guide your behavior, how you conduct your work. And, and so if you wanna see some examples of this, uh, we have a, a bunch of checklists at this site, um, but we do have a new developer checklist for Trulinos developers. So we, when we bring in a, a new postdoc or a staff member, the mentor for that person goes through that list with them. Uh, and then in terms of policies, I'd show you an exa example of the, what, the newer project called the XSDK, which is an aggregation effort uh, between the Department of uh, Energy Library Development teams to, to uh, create a community of uh, scientific library developers. And we found that policies are really important for establishing the, the, the kind of contract or expectations across these teams. Okay, so your chance, okay. So just, just tell me, uh, shout out, what would be on your new team member uh, checklist? What's an item that you would want on it? What's something you wish you had had on your checklist when you got started? Yeah, what's, to learn about what's available in terms of uh, computational resources. Okay, what else? I'm not going to go on until the end. Where are the user accounts? Yeah, yeah, detail, lots of details, right? Lots of detailed information. So we can create, say, a boilerplate checklist that has a lot of this kind of information on it. Any, any other things? Coding practices. Coding practices, yes, uh-huh. 
Yeah, so what's your expectation? And, and that actually can be built into the policies as well, right? Because that's something that's ongoing. But learning about them can be, definitely be a checklist on the entrance uh, for, the, for the initiation phase of a new person. Other things I put on is I have my students sign up for Udacity and have them take free courses. There is a nice course on software development. There's a nice course on Git and GitHub. And, there, and then depending on uh, what they're working on, if they're working on data sciences, there's a great course on data sciences. I don't want them to take it for credit. I just want them to get that background. So you can put in addition kind of uh, boilerplate learning activities. I have them uh, sometimes, you know, and when I work with undergrads, they may not know LaTeX, so I have them learn LaTeX. They may not know C++, so I have them go off and do their beginning programming exercises that were done in Java or Python and have them redo those exercises in C++ because we need them to know that. So these are the kinds of things that you can put. And then you can customize the list, add additional things for, for a specific project or team member who's adding. But the idea is to create this checklist and it makes it very tangible, unambiguous as to what the new team member is going to do. And I have found with my own students that they get a great satisfaction, first of all, of knowing exactly what I'm expecting from them. And second, as they check the boxes on each of those items, they see tangible progress. Um, as they go through their work. Um, and we'll get to some policies in a minute. Um, what's a checklist uh, item for a departure? Get a copy of everything they've done. Yeah, get a copy of everything they've done, right? And that's hard to do, even with a checklist sometimes. Okay, what else? Closing accounts. Closing accounts? Yes, exactly, yeah, what else? Ah, documentation. Thank you. Yes, that's, I was waiting for that one. Yeah, what else? Well, another one that I like is I like to overlap my students. And so if they can identify who's coming in next to do that work, to make sure that they have conveyed to that new person whatever they can before they depart. That's another one. But, but you get the idea, right? And again, building this checklist, customizing it for a student or a postdoc who's leaving soon is really valuable. Tangible, real progress, unambiguous about what you're going to be doing. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Kanban. I'm not going to give you a long lecture in Kanban. It's a, you know, it's a very advanced, there are a lot of advanced think, uh, thoughts in this area, but I do want to give you the basics in case you don't know. Just again, just an informal poll, who has heard of Kanban before? Raise your hand. Okay, a few people, okay. Who uses it? Okay, all right, cool, I like that. All right, excellent. Who uses Scrum? No? Okay. All right, I have nothing against Scrum, but I'll explain a little bit why I think in this setting Kanban is better for our purposes. Okay, so um, managing issues is a fundamental software process, right? You, you have to do this. You, you have to, in order to do your work, you have to keep track of what you want to do in some way. Now, some people, and this is fine if you're working on your own little individual project, simply remember, right? They just simply keep it in their head what they're supposed to do next. And then when they get the time to do it, they do the work. Um, but I, 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 I'm trying to encourage you, if you're doing some way of managing issues, some way of tracking what you need to do next, try to improve the way you're doing it. So right, if right now, if you're remembering it in your head, just create a little text file that has a list of the things that you plan to do. <laughs> and keep that with you, we can. You know, put it in your notes file on your, on your smartphone. Um, and if you're doing that um, already, why not take that file and put it into the root uh, directory of your repository? So that now your team members can see that same list and collaborate with you, right? That's a step up, right? That's an improvement. Um, and then you can go, you can increase the, 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 the rigor and the scope of visibility and collaboration with these lists, but incrementally improve how you do things. Um, that's, I think, is the best way to try to do productivity improvements in general. We can't stop getting our work done just to become more productive to do it. So we have to, it's like saving a penny of your, of your paycheck every, every week, right? That you're, you're shaving off just a bit of, of your, what you've earned so you can have future value from it. Productivity is similar. We want to shave off a bit of our time and effort whenever we're working so that we can put that into something that has a longer term payoff 
even you know, beyond the, the paper that we're writing or, or the degree that we're getting, that we can val get value from it in a longer span of time. And so try to continually improve the way you do your work in this way. So what we're going to talk about today is using web-based tool. We're going to use GitHub issues and projects and use Kanban, um, not Scrum, to try to build up a process that can work for a small team. Okay, so what is Kanban? Um, the Kanban principle, the, 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 the rigor and the genius of Kanban is not that it says um, you have deadlines for when things get done. Right? In science, we can't say we're going to have a eureka, an, an eureka moment by Tuesday. That doesn't work. Right? Scrum says you work on sprint cycles a few weeks typically, and that you have some predictable uh, amount of work that you can get done. That can work in a research setting, but I think it's forced, especially when you're in a highly exploratory phase of your work, and, and it's really hard to put those kind of deadlines on. But what you can impose is how many things you're working on at one time. Kanban says the amount of items that you can be working on at any one time, the amount of uh, issues in your in-progress column has to be limited. And it's a self-imposed limitation. You, know, you say, you're, tell yourself, I can only do, be doing three things at once. And then the, the productivity improvement that comes from that is that you're not allowed to move an item out of your in-progress column until you actually complete it. And so if you're not making progress on an item and you want to get to the next one, you have to look at, well, why am I not getting this done? What's, in, what's not productive about my workflow that I'm not getting an item out of here as quickly as I want to? And so it forces you to look at productivity improvements by limiting the number of in-flight items that you have at any given time. And I found this to be an effective uh, process for R&D. There are some uh, gotchas with it. In particular, if uh, your developers or your, your team members are, are working outside of the Kanban process on a regular basis, distracted by the first phone call they got in the morning and not focused on their in-progress, column, then, then um, the, lack, the fact that there's no deadline on these items simply pushes that work out. And so you really have to constantly bring people back and make sure that they're working on the in-progress items in that particular, um, in, uh, of their work of, uh, uh, items. So here is a typical basic Kanban board. You have a backlog. This can be any issue, anything that, any task that you're trying to, going, you're going to do at some point in the future, even if it's speculative. Uh, you can go back and later trim your backlog, right? Get rid of things that you know you'll never get to. Um, then the, the next column is, is, is items that if you had time, you know what you need to get done. You know the scope of the work, and they could be picked up and put into in progress at any time. If you had an open slot, you could pick up an item from your ready column, bring it in, and get started. So you know the scope of the effort uh, that's required to get that work done. Whoops, sorry. Um, and then the in-progress column is the stuff that you're working on right now. It is those items that you're working on. Um, and the only pro a rule is, is you can only have so many things. And how many of those is is your call. You get to decide. Right? You have to calibrate that. Um, and a key aspect of the work in this column is it gets pulled, right? You decide what gets put in. Um, the done column then is everything you've done. All the things that you've completed, it's actually a really nice record of your work. And so if you have to write a little status report, you can go back to this column and find out, think, oh yeah, that's right, I did do that. And it's all these things that you've done. Um, I, I like to experiment with columns, trying different things. Um, I think a really good one for you, do it respectfully now, mind you. Don't get me in trouble with your advisor. But you could add a column to your Kanban board that says, waiting on my advisor. Okay? Every item that goes into the, a column gets time stamped, right? And so you can highlight in your workflow if your advisor is particularly slow about getting back to you on things, this highlights that workflow impediment, right? I also have a column. Again, I abuse Kanban for, because I'm trying out various things. I have one uh, task I won't do, right? So I, in, in that, I have two things now is I, I won't schedule a meeting for longer than 30 minutes. I find that by using my Kanban boards to run meetings, you know, updates, I can actually get a lot more 
uh, we can get through all of our work content in a lot less time. And so it's a challenge to me to keep many meetings much shorter. My previous default was about an hour, right? And so I also, I, I won't go and give talks where I don't think I'm the best person, resource available to give that talk. Okay, and so that way, you know, I'm not signing up to do things that I think someone else could do a better job of. Um, okay, so anyway, these are various columns uh, and, and it's fun to play around with. Um, I'm not necessarily promoting this book, but I found it useful myself. There's a book called Personal Kanban, which, which does a nice job of describing all the various things that a person can uh, explore in this area. I, I do manage my entire personal life using Kanban. I use a tool called Trello. It has a, a, a smartphone, tablet, and web uh, a site uh, interface. And so anywhere I go, I can see the content, all the things I'm supposed to be working on. If I'm having trouble sleeping in the middle of the night because something's bothering me, something I'm supposed to get done, I can roll over, grab my phone, tap, type in uh, that task in my backlog, and then go back to sleep. And I know it's captured, right? Those kinds of things. So, so um, it, it, I find it to be a very useful way to manage my general workflow. And so there are lots of ways you can do Kanban, uh, just a wall or a whiteboard, a blackboard, you know, very basic approach. If you're all co-located, you know, having a whiteboard with sticky notes is a very reasonable way. It's very physical, very tangible in how you do this. Um, and then there's software-based, you know, Trello, Jira, GitHub issues, many more. And I, as I said, I use Trello. So the big question is how many tasks? It's really a personal question. Um, you'll start with two or three. Um, and see how it goes, right? If you, if you feel like you can have more things in flight, then add one more, but be cautious. Don't try to get too many things up and in, in, in progress at any one time. Um, I also use what's called an in review column um, for things that I've completed and I want someone else to look at. So I slide an item over from in progress to in review and then I send off an, you know, a note to somebody saying, you know, hey, would you look at this? That way I don't drop it, it's not missing but then they can get back to me and I, and, or I may have to get back to them to remind them that it's in review. Uh, and, and I like the freeway analogy for how many you should use. You know, so how much of your life should you schedule? You know, is a freeway optimal when every slot in the freeway is, has a car? You no, know, usually it's a parking lot, right? And so if you, if you use that analogy, having fewer in progress tasks, then you have time you know, to get your work done. That gives you the opportunity for some spontaneity, you know, some work that you didn't plan, but it's really a good important opportunity. In the same way, having a less than full freeway allows you to switch lanes and get around slower traffic. So the, I think these are, it's a good uh, example of you know, keep in mind as you guide your activity. I also really use, consult your board on a regular basis. It's really important to do that. It really keeps you focused on what is most important. It helps you organize your day. And if you forget for a day or two or a week, you know, to go back and look at what you're doing, you just do whatever is coming into your inbox or whatever someone comes in and talks to you about, be patient with yourself. Go back, start over, right? This is not, this is something we have to grow. We have to build this habit into our life, uh, life uh, uh, cycle our own uh, um, activities. And so don't get frustrated, don't drop it, just recognize that the startup phase of any new habit takes time. All right. Um, so I wanna make just special emphasis about in progress. So for a junior member, you do not necessarily dictate all the things that you get to do, right? You may be thrown things thrown at you on a regular basis and your mentor expects you to prioritize and, and and say, you know, push back is something if you have just too much to do. If you regularly manage your life, uh, your, 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 your work life using something like Kanban, your in progress column is the list of things that you're supposed to be doing. It's a concrete record of those activities. If it is full, you can honestly say to yourself and to the person giving you the next chunk of work, what do you want me to take away? What, or, you know, I, I'm, I'm practicing Kanban, you know how well it works. You need to wait, I need to wait until I can pull something in. And it's gonna take me probably a couple of weeks before I can slot this in. Now sometimes it's really urgent to do something that's not in your in progress uh, column, fine. 
step away from it and do the urgent things. But it shouldn't be your regular mode of operation. By really practicing this approach uh, it, you know, rigorously, you empower yourself to manage your regular and daily life uh, work in a way that you didn't have before. It's very, very useful. OK, let's talk then about key team management elements. Um, so as I mentioned, checklists, policies, and an issue tracking system. And I've been using this. Uh, so I, I teach at St. John's University in Minnesota. Um, I live in Collegeville Township on a little lake out in the country. Uh, and, and St. John's is in Collegeville Township. So it's kind of a little play on words. But Collegeville is our GitHub organization. And so as, and it's an educational organization. So I applied for the free private repo status, which I recommend. It's a really nice uh, feature that GitHub has. Uh, you know, uh, since it doesn't give out free re private repos to just everybody, uh, you can apply for it and get that. Uh, so, so maybe a bit of small type, but here I wanted to show you our team policy. Um, there's also a, a, a Benedict and Abbey on the campus, and so, so we picked kind of Latin names for some of our, so Labora is our, is our issues only repo. Okay, well, it's funny to me. Um, anyway, um, so, so anyway, so you can see some of the items on this. Uh, you know, first on the top is actually a conduct policy, right? How do we expect to treat each other? The institution, uh, the university, actually has a conduct policy. So I want to refer to that in our work. That buys us a lot. Now we don't have to sit and, and you know, when someone's behaving badly, you know, we can point to this. And in fact, even better, they understand that we have expectations on behavior from our team members. Um, you know, then we have initiation, transition, and exit events will be create, uh, guided by creating and following event checklist. All work will be tracked in this Labora repository, and so on. You can see. And so this, this, is, a, this is a living document, right? We, we add and remove things as we see them to be important for the team. But this sets the expectations for how team members behave and how they conduct their work throughout the span of their time on the project. Um, this is a student who just started. Uh, uh, late spring this year, this was his uh, initiation checklist. So again, create a GitHub account, become a member of the repositories, uh, and so on. Learn LaTeX, uh, and so on. So, so then as he went uh, through this list, he got a real appreciation for his progress. I could see it, because I could just go out and look at it. Um, and, and so that's an example of a checklist. Uh, then we manage activities as a team using a GitHub project board. And I, I construct a, a Kanban board using the, this project board uh, feature in GitHub. I create the backlog column, uh, the ready column in progress, in review, and done. And so when we meet, which is about once a week, whether virtually or in person, I, I remind my students, update all your issues, everything you're working on. And then we go through, our meeting is we scan through. We do the in-progress column. We go each item in in-progress. Then uh, if something gets done, we move it to done. If something needs to be reviewed, we move it to review. And then we look at the ready column and see what should be coming in next. And that's the meeting. And we can get all that accomplished in a very short span of time. So it's a very nice way for us to manage our activities. All right, so now what I'd like to do is have you walk through. I'd like to, by the time we're done with this, we've got about 25 minutes or so, that you would have a sample of this kind of setup. So that's why I wanted you to create six to eight issues. Uh, so I'm going to talk you through the process. Of, first of all, we're going to create a, a throwaway repository. One nice thing about GitHub and others is you, know, you can create repositories, delete them, and, and you, know, you can use it as a playground. It works very well. I mean, we tend to use, think about it, well, it's meant to live forever, but there's still things that you can throw away. And so that's what we're going to do. OK, so what's the first step? OK, first step is um, uh, if you, you know, I'm assuming most of you have this account. So go to your main, uh, main page. And I'm going to see if I can bring this up on my own. OK, so here is my main page. OK, I'm going to drag this over. OK, so on your main page, you can see a kind of a profile of you know, what, what your, your team members are doing, what you are doing. Um, here I can reload mine. OK, so these are 
you know, many of the repos I'm involved in so I can get to, you know, a, a sense of what's going on today. Um, okay, what, then what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go over and I'm gonna click on the, tap on the plus sign and we're gonna create a new repository. Okay, so follow along if you will. It's most effective if you can be typing along with me. Um, and if this is, you're an expert in this, then fine, just sit back and relax. But uh, if not, please, I encourage you to follow along. Okay, and then I'm gonna create a new repository. I'll just call mine Issues. Uh, um, and I'll make it public. Uh, if you don't have a paid account or an educational account, it will have to be public. It's one of the, the I think, limitations of GitHub if you care about some privacy issues. Um, I, it's, uh, it's usually nice to initialize any repository with a readme file. It gives you a file in the re repo. Um, I'm not gonna add any .gitignore extensions at this point. I don't need to necessarily add a license to this kind of repo, and so I'll just create it. Okay, so now I have a new repository. Okay, and I have a readme file. Uh, and it's just, at this point, just has the name of the uh, repo in it. Okay, now what I'd like you to do, everybody, anybody have trouble with that? Oh, dang, and, and anybody? So uh, I'm looking for red stickies. Anybody have a red sticky on? It's kind of hard to see with the light shining at me. Okay, everybody got that far? Okay, great. All right, um, then the next step is to define a team policy. So I wanna give you a few minutes to think about, and it doesn't have to be exhaustive, but think about your team and maybe some of the challenges, some of the crises, right? Because often policies get established when something happens, when a crisis happens. Although I think a more positive way to get a new policy is to look at the things that are going well and try to describe those things and write them down so that you, everybody practices those things, right? But, but try to think of two, both of those kind of sources for team policies and just create a few of them. Um, and so, Let's see, I'll bring this up full screen again. So how do you create, uh, and how do you, so, so you go to your, and then you uh, select the code tab, and then you're gonna create a new file, we'll call it teampolicy.md. .md stands for markdown. Uh, uh, GitHub uh, uses a flavor of markdown that's uh, you know, close to the kind of common body of, of syntax. Um, okay, and then, how, how do members support teams? Uh, members support a team. How does a team support members? That's another way to try to think of good policy. Um, there's a, a commonly known contributor covenant that is very uh, comprehensive in what it, says, it sets in terms of expectations. Um, and this policy is a living document. Okay, so, whoops. Okay, so I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna create a new file. I'll call it team policy. And then you can start editing. So, so um, from, from least favorite to most favorite, my ways in the, are of, of working with a Git repo are uh, using command line, least, that's least uh, attractive to me most of the time. Um, then next attractive is to use the GitHub desktop client. I really like the, the GitHub desktop client. And then the best way for the things it's appropriate for is the website. You know, actually creating content in real time. And, and now you can't program, you can't write code that very, very effectively, but you can do a lot of content development right on the GitHub site using a website. Okay, and so a, a single hash mark is a big title. So I'm gonna say team policy. And then um, you can put in a description. And then you can start putting in uh, items. Now uh, GitHub Markdown, you know, a dash um, create, starts a creative list. Um, so this can be, you know, policy. I'm not gonna to try to think on the fly here. Policy one, policy two, you know, policy three. And then you can uh, scroll down to the bottom of the page. You can create a, a, 
a, a 50 character message, right, for the commit. If you want, or just take the default, I'm just going to use the default for now. You can add an extended description. You know, Alicia t showed you some of the, the ways that you could create good commit messages. And I'm going to commit this directly to master. And now I have a file called team policy. And, and here it is. And so now anybody who on the team can see what our team policy is. Um, all right. Okay, now we want to go through, so now we have a team policy, and again, this is actually something you carry on in a conversation. You, I would dedicate a whole team meeting, you know, to, to identifying the first version of a team policy. It's a great conversation. Anytime I've had it, it's amazing how you come to understand each other better. It helps reduce cultural barriers, better understanding where each person is coming from on the team. It's really an excellent tool, and the larger the team, the more important it is to spend time creating a document like this. It, it will save you so many headaches in the future. And you, again, more positively can, uh, promote better, best behaviors as you go along. So I really, so, so as scientists, I don't know, we, we, we get this um, you know, touchy-feely stuff shaved off of us uh, often, right? You know, we're, we're not maybe so comfortable. Maybe part of why we got into science was so we wouldn't have to spend so much time Right. I, I, t I have a postdoc who, uh, who d we just had a conversation yesterday. He said, yeah, if you get a tools person in, you know, in a private room, they will admit the reason why they're tools persons is because they want to automate everyone and get people out of their lives. Right. You know, if they're honest with you, they'll admit that. Right. That it's because they don't want people around. They want a, the machine to do the work. And that's why they're tools people. I, I never appreciated that point before. Okay, but even so, we, I think if, if we want our human experiences to be as positive as possible, I think spending some time on these specific activities that I'm mentioning to you here can be really, really helpful. All right, so now I ask you to, to have a list of, you know, say six to eight, and it doesn't have to be exactly that many, but I want some because we, I want to use these issues. I want you to type them in, and I want to use these issues to populate uh, the Kanban board, the project board we're going to create next, so I can explain to you exactly what this board, how it can be used, okay? So, so take some time, maybe just a few minutes, five minutes, make them bogus, whatever you want to do, okay? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to type mine in because I'm going to show you a, a real live one that I'm using uh, and, and give you maybe a deeper sense of how it can be used. So take a, just a few minutes to create an issue. So I'll create one just to kind of walk you through it. Um, All right, so we're, we're back in our issues repository, right? This is the repository we're going to use. So, so some people call this an issues-only repository, okay? It has some files in it. For example, we're putting our team policy into it. That's a, that's a markdown file. But it doesn't have code, okay? And so, so an issues-only repository is really one that's focused on creating and managing team issues. And you might wonder, well, why shouldn't I just do that in my repo? Okay, well, yes, if you, if you have a source code repository, you should keep all the issues associated with that specific project in the issues uh, database for that repository. So if you're working on you know, a CFD code and you have software features for that CFD code, those issues should be kept in the CFD code repository. But what I'm talking about here is larger scale, broader issues that are about how the team conducts its activities. And so you want, and over time you'll get a sense of where an issue should go. If it's something that's bigger picture, you know, not necessarily tied to a specific software product, or if it's something that goes into a product itself, you'll know where that, that, uh, the, the uh, trade-off uh, occurs, you know, which, which way it should go. But, but there are many issues that can go into an issues only uh, repo that help the team overall, that cross cut the entire project. Okay, and so how do you create one? Well, you tap on the issues um, and you click on new issue. And again, I'm just gonna do something silly. Okay, you put the title in. Uh, you can, you know, put in a comment. Um, here, you know, if it's a larger issue, you can use a checklist. Um, how you do checklists in uh, GitHub Markdown, and this is true even for uh, issues, is you do a, a, the hyphen space 
and then the left square bracket space, and the spaces are important, left square bracket space, right square bracket space, and then you know first checklist item. Okay, and then you can submit that new issue. And so you can see here now in the, in the, it, this is rendered special. And so if I get that checklist item done, I can tap on it and it gets marked off. And if you go back and look at the source, there's actually now an X inside those square brackets. So, uh, so that's the correlation between the raw and the, what you see on the screen. Okay, so again, let's create a few issues uh, just so you can have some things to play around with while we get to the next phase. Yeah, and so you're gonna repeat this process. And again, just make it quick so you have something in there. No, any, actually anybody who has permissions on the repo can check the box. Yeah, yeah, it's very neat, it works really well. So, so I create the lists for my students, all their work items, and then they get to check the box off when they're done. That's, and it's, it has very nice, lots of nice visual effects with these checklists. And in fact, that is the, the next one. I'll, I'll just keep talking as you create these. Uh, and because I've already showed you a bit how to do this. So, so as I said, initiation checklists, lists, exit checklists. Um, I also find checklists really useful when I'm sitting down for a student and we're embarking on a brand new topic, right? Because then I can create this checklist of, okay, you know, I, had to just, I just had a student starting to look at uh, doing, a, 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 you know, we, we have this Petra object model, our data classes uh, for Trilinos, and I'm having a student look at native Julia implementations. So Julia is a new, you know, newer programming language. And so, you know, I, we create, we worked on a checklist. Okay, well, here's where you go learn about Julia. Gave them the URL. You know, here's where you go learn about the Petra object model, right? And so we created this list of, a, I don't know, half a dozen or a dozen items. Um, and this was his new initiation checklist, but for the specific activity, right? It wasn't his entry into the project, but entry into this effort. So that way we could uh, communicate and coordinate his activities and be very precise about how we're doing and I could see the progress he was making as he, as he checked off each item. Okay, and so, so um, you know, keep going. The, the initiation checklist, it, I'm, I, like I said, I already showed you a little bit how to do this. You don't have to necessarily create one um, at this time, but um, how far, are, how many have, people have, you know, say, you know, five to eight issues typed in? Okay, raise your hands, okay. Um, do I see any red stickers up? Anybody struggling? We have people who can help too. So if anybody struggling? Okay, good. I'll, I'll give you a minute um, yet to keep typing. Okay, um, uh, how, how are we doing? You have, you have enough of them typed in? Again, we're gonna use, the reason I want these typed in is because I want you to have some experience uh, working with a Kanban board. We're gonna place these issues on a Kanban board. Okay, so, so we'll go through, um, again, the initiation checklist, great to have, but let, we don't have to worry about that right now. Let's go on and move to the create a Kanban board. Okay, so, um, a uh, Kanban board, so, so if you, if you who, who's worked with Jira before? Atlassian product called Jira? Okay, a few people, okay. So, so Jira has uh, uh, Kanban boards that, that can be automatically generated. You can actually create a board. It will take, the, uh, uh, take a collection of issues, you know, tasks, and you, you can record for each issue its status, whether it's uh, in the backlog or, or in progress uh, or done. And, and that's, a, that's a known attribute of an issue. And so you, uh, Jira will actually create a Kanban board for you. 
and populate all the columns with the various statuses of the issues. You can also use labels in JIRA to you know, say whether an issue is you related to a specific overarching, say, say you're working with a specific client or user, you can put a label on that marks that uh, issue as being related to that client or user. And so JIRA has this very nice way of very quickly create, allowing you to create Kanban boards that are customized uh, for a specific situation. GitHub does not, okay? GitHub is very manual, um, but it, it's okay, right? It's, it's, it's you know, minimal in a, a reasonable way, okay? And so what we're gonna go through then is to create manually a Kanban board using GitHub uh, project. And, and again, this won't scale, right? So this, this, this approach, the GitHub approach, won't scale to hundreds of issues. It's just way too manual for that, but I find it very useful for manag managing specific uh, perspectives on my project. So in the Trulinos project, for example, we, we have you know, thousands of users, but we have a handful of people who pay real money to us for the development. And so we have a special group we call SART, Sierra, ATDM, Ramses, and Trulinos. We meet about once a week, and there are specific issues that they have asked for us to create, to, you know, features they have asked for us or problems or, to, you know, we're trying to debug problems on, on uh, uh, Sierra Dev right now, which is the next big system going into Lawrence Livermore, right? And there are all sorts of issues with the compilers with that. And so we track these issues. Um, and so once we, when we meet, we have the SART board, uh, GitHub board, where we manage the issues related to those particular clients. And then when we meet, we sit down and we go through the list, just like I described. We talk about in progress, what then move to done, talk about what's in review, we talk about what's in ready that could go into in progress, and so on. And so using this, these Kanban boards, we can get a lot of uh, really positive uh, progress on the issues, and our users can see where we are with the status of things. So it's a really useful tool for that. Um, and you can do the same thing in JIRA. We actually go through JIRA as well because we have some issues that we keep on a JIRA board. And by, you can support multiple um, data issue databases by, having, by using these Kanban boards because it allows you to quickly move from one, uh, st uh, one uh, issue database to the next without having a lot of trouble. And so it works quite well. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna select the projects tab. You can see it there in the right corner. We're gonna click on new project and just again, use whatever title you want, but we're gonna call this the team Kanban board. We're gonna add columns, backlog, ready, and progress in review and done. And then we're gonna click on add cards. And I'm gonna do that along with you here so you can see how to do it. If you haven't already figured it out. Okay, so I'm clicking on projects. I'm gonna create a project. I'm gonna give it a name. Save that project. And I'm gonna add a column. So backlog. Uh, ready. Oops. In progress. Uh, and in review, and I'm going to slide over here and have done. Oops. Okay. So I now have all my columns. Okay. Now what I can do is I can go to add cards, and what you'll see is all my issues. Right. So any issue that I've created is now. Um, uh, available for, for sliding over. Now this does not disturb that card's location in the database. This is simply a meta-organization of the issues, a, a different way of looking at, different uh, perspective on the same set of issues. And so I'm going to move my first issue over, just drag it over, and that one's in progress. And then I just, you know, again, I made silly ones, but I'm gonna move this one over to to ready, actually tell me, can I put this one in ready? Based on the principles that I taught you, can I put this second issue into the ready column? You're, you're uh, shaking your head, no, that's correct, why? Because the only thing that can go into ready are things that are ready to be worked on. Where the work is scoped, I know exactly what to do, but because it depends on the first one, I can't put it there. So I actually have to move it over to the 
backlog queue. And now I can take this one, this can go into backlog as well. Okay, and so those are, and then, you know, in a real database, you're gonna have hundreds of issues. We always, in Trillium, for whatever reason, we always have right around 540 of them that are open, right? Doesn't, every, every day I go there, there's 540 of them open. Uh, and, uh, and, but they're different ones, that's the good part. Um, so anyway, um, so, so you can filter on, you know, on, on label, you can filter on uh, you know, keywords and things like that. So you don't have to search all of them for this. Okay, so now you have a project board and then what you do with this project board? Well, again, you can use this to manage activities. Every time I meet with my students, I say, you know, hey, update, make sure your issues are up to date, both in terms of the status in the comment field you know, so I can, I, you know, so we regularly manage our issues and every time the students have a question or they made some progress, they want some confirmation, they type in a new comment into that issue. I get email and then I can respond to that and also that creates a new comment. So all of our, all of the conversation, every decision that we've made about a particular topic Highly technical, highly detailed, right? We're talking right now, I'm with this Neil stu student, Neil Lindquist, about design choices with Julia. You know, how do you deal with uh, polymorphic behavior, you know, that we, are, we use uh, base, abstract base classes with in C++. How do you deal with that in Julia? Julia has multiple dispatch. It has what's called duct typing, which is you can pass in an object, and if you call, you know, if you call an ob a method on that object in a function, if that method is there, and it's available, you just call it, right? You don't even have to declare that it's, that it's a derived class for the interface, it just works. Okay, the problem is if you pass in an object that doesn't have that function attached to it, the code will, will, will stop, right? And, and so there's some risk associated with that. So we're trying to explain, explore these design choices with Julia and object-oriented programming, all of the conversation associated with those design choices is captured in these issues. Right, so it's a tremendous repository. So now, you know, when Neil is done in a couple of years, I bring in a new student. This new student has this rich collection of every design choice we made and why we made it. It's just a beautiful collection of information. Right, so this is a, a tremendous uh, legacy that Neil leaves behind for us as, as we try to move forward. Okay. Let's see, make sure I'm all right, so um, how are we doing on time? We've got about 45 seconds on that, and then um, time. Okay, very good. So we got a few minutes. All right, um, I'll just show you very briefly. Uh, um, the Labora repo. Um, and so here we have, you know, a license, a readme file. Oh, also at the beginning of the summer, people are coming and going. So I just had them, you know, put in their availabilities during the summer, including mine. So everybody knows where everybody is. Um, here's our team policy right here. Uh, and, but really the main bulk of this repo is the set of issues and our project board. So now I can go and, and, and when we have a meeting and talk with all of my students about the things that they're working on, so you know, these are the basic things um, uh, that we're working on. So we go through this list. Uh, here are some of the initiation checklists. Some of the students are still working through a, a few of the items. So this gives you a sense then of you know, what we're doing. This is a working, uh, a live database. All right, so hopefully I've given you, you know, some, some kind of information, a framework that you will inspire you to think about how you can bring this back to your institution, to your team, and try to do a few things. So that's what you know, real life is like. Um, my, my final point on this is that really, the key is to start and to use it. And when you drop it or get distracted, don't give up. Pick yourself up and do it again, right? And, and keep going, right? Building habits takes time. But this is a very positive thing to do. And here are some other uh, resources. In particular, a book, I, I do a lot of Audible, uh, re listening to books uh, on my phone. Um, and uh, one of the best books I've listened to, I've actually listened to it twice, is The, is the Agile Samurai. I just find it a very, for me, a non-expert in software engineering, 
it's a very careful and, and uh, convincing argument for best practices uh, in agile uh, methodologies. Um, I also am a big fan, again, of, 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 uh, of Steve McConnell. His uh, book, Code Complete, is now really old, and he's not producing a, another version of it. But he has a, a large collection of really good content on a soft, his company's called Constructs. And again, I, I can't promote a specific thing. I'm just telling you what has really worked for me. Um, and I find his sensibilities on, uh, on software re translate very well to the scientific domain, more than other th people I've read and listened to in general. So, all right, uh, I'll stop here and take any questions or comments that people have. Yes, please. Well, this uh, process you just went through works with GitLab as well. I'm not. I'm not a big. So the question was, does this work with GitLab? I I am not a big GitLab user. I'm a novice. I only do very basic things with GitLab. So I don't know. Someone else might be able to answer that for you in the group. Anybody else have an answer for that? I know that things like pull re merge requests. Pull requests are called merge requests. Right. So there are. Co go ahead, Alicia. What were you going to say? Uh, use it. Use the microphone. I think you have one right there. Uh, I use GitLab for some of my projects, and they definitely allow you to create issues and whatnot. The functionality is very similar to GitHub. Yeah, it's built off of Airport, too. I have it currently up right now. I'm playing with it. So. Okay, great. So, so the answer is yes, it works. Okay, there's your answer. All right, great. Any other questions? Comments? Yes, please. More about the app you are using on your phone, like the channels. Oh yeah, yeah. So the, the the question was, what app am I using on my phone? I'm using something called Trello. Uh, I guess they were actually recently purchased, bought out by by Atlassian, the people who produce Confluence and Jira, HipChat, um, and and it you know it's a very nice, very robust app. Works on on you know any mobile device, uh, phone or or tablet. And then there's a website version of it as well that you can get from, you know, from any, any browser. And, and again, I don't want to promote a particular tool, but that works really well for me. And I manage my entire life by it. Yes, please. Um, so do you have any recommendations for when you're on multiple projects that may have multiple <coughs> command boards? And how yeah. do I yeah. pull that into something where yeah. I see it? Yeah, so the question is, what if you have multiple projects? Okay, it is a great question. It is a fabulous question. Um, at this point, I am resigned to managing, you know, time slicing and, and focus slicing my work across multiple repositories, multiple projects. And, and I don't know a better way. I've looked for tools that can bring you know, information together. There are all sorts of plugins. You know, Jira can bring in snapshots of GitHub issues. And, but I just find that all so fragile and hokey that I, I so, so my, my alternative to trying to bring it into one is to be very efficient about my viewing of each, each of those sources. And that's why that's a major benefit to having a Kanban board is that it allows you to rapidly go between issue databases. And so when I run the SART meeting at Sandia, we have two issue databases. One is the GitHub one and one is Jira, where we you know, manage things that, are, that really aren't appropriate for GitHub. And our meeting is, is first, we spend the first 15 minutes or so on the, first, on the GitHub one, and then we spend the next 15 minutes on the Jira one. And, and you know, it really doesn't matter so much, right? As long as we're familiar with both APIs, it doesn't matter so much that we split the conversation between two distinct issue databases because we have a very efficient way of looking at all of them. And I could see you doing the same thing for half a dozen projects, right? As long as the view that you have of each project is efficient and you can move quickly between them, it's a single URL to get access to either or any of them, it's really not bad. And to me, that's the best alternative. What, what it doesn't allow you to do is to see everything that you have in terms of work in progress. What, you know, gosh, that, that, that's the hard part, right? Is, and it doesn't allow your, the supervisor for your one project to see, okay, yes, this person only has one work in progress item for me, but you know, they're doing three other things over in this project. They, can't, they don't have that visibility, but I don't see how you structurally address that. It's really hard to do. Other than conveying to that first manager, I can only give you, you know, one whip. One, one in progress item at a time. 
And, and that's, so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm still looking for ways to address that. Great question. Anything else? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on um, challenges, team dynamics challenges from a generational perspective. So a lot of the older guys want to put the blinders on and code for hours at a time. The phone may ring or the email may come in, but I, I have control over that. I can shut it out. Yeah. The younger guys get infinitely frustrated with me when I don't keep a Slack channel open. And they've grown up on social media, they want instant feedback. Yeah. And yeah. that's the last thing I want, you yeah. know, as I'm coding. Yeah. How, how, how do you suggest dealing with that? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great question. I use Slack, and actually that's something else we do use on the project. And one of the things we've had to, to uh, figure out is, you know, what conversations are best for Slack, what are best for GitHub issues. We, were, we started having highly detailed technical conversations on Slack and realizing, well, that content's gonna be gone, right? We're not gonna have a permanent copy of that. And so we actually copied the Slack content over to GitHub so that we didn't lose these detailed conversations. Um, part of it is be open-minded and, and try to try as best you can to adopt these new tools. Um, but, but I think also that, that uh, you know, the newer team members have to recognize that, you know, there's significant overhead for senior people to adopt new workflows and that it may not be always the best thing, you know, for that to happen. I mean, we've seen that here in the dynamics here, right? I mean, a lot of the people in this room, you know, know details of the tool sets that we're using because they are doing much more day in and day out in terms of development and they don't have the, you know, the, the, the legacy to address, right, the code that they wrote 20 years ago and to answer questions on. And, and so, you know, they're very, you know, new and fresh and ready to use anything that's brand new. Um, so I, I don't know, I don't have a, a sage answer other than those, some of those observations. Um, I do think though, and I'll get to this in the next portion of the conversation, that if we specify, um, you know, rigorous goals for reproducibility, for code quality, for a recognition, that having that bigger goal out there, you know, what makes us most productive, does drive us to good answers. If, if we don't have an incentive to be more productive, then it's you know, your approach versus mine, and, and you know, we, we can fight about it because there's no consequence associated with a bad choice. But if, if you have to be productive to get your work done, uh, and you're, you know, then, then that forces us to try new approaches. Yeah, aren't you? You want to make so, a comment? So, uh, yeah, I faced the same problem. I'm weighing in on this uh, Slack versus whatever else issue, and I've had the same problem. And I found that having being available on Slack all the time is too distracting. You cannot get anything done, especially if you're on multiple <coughs> projects. You're forever just monitoring those channels. So the way I get around that problem is I put my status as away on everything on Slack. Where, where it's most useful is if you are working actively with someone remote, when you want to have the instantaneous communication open. So I make available only for such conversations on a as needed basis. And that works out really well because there is no substitute for Slack when you are actively working on something and you want to have instantaneous communication. Yeah, I, I, I find, so the, the analogy I like best, uh, the, the, the ACME team, the uh, climate model, DOE climate modeling team, they use Slack a lot. And they, you know, they're a distributed team and the best description I heard of that is, it's like having, going down the hall and talking to your colleague, right? That's the kind of conversation you be, should be having on Slack. You know, quick question, quick query, quick, quick you know, ping of, a, of another person, just like walking down the hall. But because they're at a different lab or somewhere on a different continent, you can't do that. So Slack gives you that kind of uh, conversation channel. And you really shouldn't use it for anything else, or maybe shouldn't is the wrong word, but that's the way they found it most effective. And, and I think we should be open to, to trying that. I, 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 I'm trying myself, right? Even though I'm definitely in the uh, uh, senior crowd. All right, anything else? Yeah, please. I wanted to comment on the question about uh, multiple repositories. Yeah. With GitHub, you can, when you have your organization, yeah. you can click, you can create a project for that organization. Oh, cool, I didn't know And that. then you have 
access to all of the cards for all of the issues of all of the repositories. Oh, thank you. Wow, I should pay you something for that. <laughs> Appreciate that. Great. Thank you. That's nice. I learned something. Cool. Yeah, but yeah. the challenge still remains in that if you are on a multiple, uh, if you are on multiple projects, they each have, and if they are using any of the uh, project management tools like Jira or Kanban, yeah. each project does it differently, and yep. I, there isn't anything that lets you, as a member of multiple projects, lets you combine your view of where you are. Right. Yeah, and it's that, fundamentally true, but that's if, still if a If cool one of feature. you wants to have a startup about that, that would be a very good thing to do. Or you'd go out of business before you, anyway. I don't know. <laughs> okay, any more comments and questions on this topic?